All right, we're going to do another steam boiler service today. This time turned out to be a little bit different from the last time you saw me do this. Actually, on the water side of this, it was pretty clean. But then when I went and looked at the burners, uh-oh. I don't know if you saw those crispy wires there, but this thing is definitely not drafting out. I took all these burners out to get a better idea of what I was looking at. And I pulled the top cover of the boiler so that I could get the draft hood off. And while I was waiting for somebody to come and bring me some brushes and some other stuff, I decided to take everything else apart so I could continue the rest of my service. You see here, I'm going to take apart these vents so that I can look inside of the chimney. And I have to take the vent out anyway to get the rest of the boiler apart. So I got the draft hood off, and then the next part is actually a little bit harder to get off. I started cleaning out the burner tray. You can see all the refractory cement and everything that fell in there. Look at these burners. Trashed. But I started cleaning them up because I'm still waiting on some stuff to come. And here's Tommy. Tommy showed up. He wanted to get his hands dirty for five minutes, so I let him do a little bit of it. Sits around in his office making price books, so I know he's... You know, he misses being out here. So what you just saw was in between the boiler sections and the left and right side of the boiler was like completely plugged up. I spent about an hour and a half with brushes just working them back and forth in there. Shined a light through it so I could see and make sure I could get down to the burner from all of the sections. And there's a little weep hole on the end. I don't know if you see that, that little calcium buildup, but that's going to come back to bite me. So everything that dropped out from there, I had to go into the burner chamber and clean all of that stuff out. That was probably another hour of doing that because I had to scrape the bottom really good. Then I had to scrape off all of these burners. I'm doing the same thing with a brush. Then I went back with a wire brush. Then I went back with a scotch bright pad and emery cloth. That probably took me about an hour to do that. Now I had to put these bolts back in and put the draft hood back on. Um, if you take a little loose piece of insulation off of the side of the boiler and stick it in there to hold the bolt, that you know that'll save your life someday in the future because dropping those bolts really sucks and look at that look how nice and clean that burner tray is beautiful i put the whole thing back together so that i could get back to the rest of my service and then i just finished like i always do i had the low water cut off off i cleaned that put that back on i had taken the pressure troll off and the gauge and i put all that stuff back on cleaned the pigtail cleaned the gauge glass filled it up and i filled it up high just to see and this boiler was leaking so, I got it running for now because realistically it's leaking on the steam side, but realistically we're going to have to do something about that. The old man appreciates the time I put into this, so he's probably just going to buy a new boiler from me. But here's a candid shot of the steam coming up out of the chimney. Anyway, see you on the next one. All right, today we're doing a simple steam boiler maintenance. Unfortunately, my friends in Europe are not going to understand this one, which is really upsetting because they're all just so smart. So anyway, we're going to start by draining the boiler. Obviously, you see that this one doesn't want to drain this was just serviced last year i don't know to what extent but i actually had to hook up a hose and blow water through this drain so that i could get water out of it because otherwise i'd have no way of draining the boiler it dawned on me that it was possible that i wasn't able to use a sight glass to check the level of the water and yeah i was right and the reason i'm doing this with buckets and pitchers is because i want gravity to do some of the work for me this isn't like hot water where we have pressure to assist us and look i was right empty boiler full sight glass once I got the boiler drained, I started putting some water through to start getting some of the sludge out of the Hartford loop. This service is all about the sludge. You're going to pick up on that. Next, I took that drain out and I put it into my regular boiler drain. And I used the water to unclog the drain and to push some of the sludge off of the bottom. Out that T. Look at that. I got to do this before any of the other things that I originally intended to do here. So... It's safe to say there's really no set amount of time that this should take. So the next thing I'm going to take apart this sight glass. You see I took apart the valves. I'm going to take the low water cutoff off. And all of that is just going to get cleaned in the sink. I'm going to clean the probe for the low water cutoff. I'm going to clean those valves. And the low water cutoff is going to go back on before I proceed with my next step. I use pipe dope only on the low water cutoff. That was a thing at one point. I don't think it still is. But I've done no research to further my conclusion on the subject. So for now, pipe dope only. Next, I'm going to use the rod that's sitting on the side of the sight glass, and I'm going to start opening up this nipple that goes into the boiler, and I'm going to start blowing water through it. I'm going to try and get all the sludge out through there, put that part of the valve on, and then I'm going to do the top. The top should have less sludge in it. Now I'm going to drain the boiler again, hand over hand, bucket over bucket, and I'm going to take apart the pressure troll. For all intents and purposes, it's just that thing that looks like that. And all this stuff, the same as before, I'm going to go in the sink, clean it all out, make sure water flows through it. And what do you think I'm going to do next? That's right. I'm going to put it all back. How simple is that? So now that that's all done, I'm going to flip the switch, test my low water cutoff. There's no water in the boiler, so it's not starting. Once that's done, I'm going to do a little chemical treatment. I got this Hercules. It's an OD product, boiler and heating cleaner. They sent me five gallons of this stuff. 
And I'm going to feed it in this way. It's not really the best way, but, you know, port's a port in a storm. I think that's what that means. And from there, I'm going to start filling the boiler up. And right about there. When it's running, we'll see the water go up and down, but not too much. We'll hear the air coming out of the air vents. And that's a wrap, folks. Steam boiler maintenance. See you on the next one. All right, we're doing a triple play today. A triple play is a common job that we do during heating season for hot water boilers when a customer has a leak and relief valve. That's that pipe that drips that you're always putting the bucket under. So anyway, there's three major components here. Obviously, we have the pressure reducing valve, which is going to bring the pressure down from the city pressure down to about 12 to 15 PSI. We have the expansion tank, which is going to do what expansion tanks do. And we have the relief valve. The relief valve really should always be changed every time you do a job like this because once it leaks, it doesn't like to close back up again. Now, in this case, I was close to 25 pounds inside of the boiler when it was cold. So I know the pressure reducer was a problem, but we like to change the expansion tanks anyway, just while we're at it. It gives a little bit of extra peace of mind. Now, expansion tanks can actually be serviced. You can expect to lose a pound of pressure inside of an expansion tank every year. So it really should be done every year or two years. But I don't know. We just change them out when we do jobs like this. Makes more sense. And then every time I do one of these, I change these can vents out. I don't charge anything extra for that. But that's it. See you on the next one. All right, let's talk about zone valves. I'm going to try to explain them to the best of my ability because they're complicated for a lot of guys to understand. Now, when you walk in, you're pretty much always going to see a rat's nest like that. The first thing that you're going to do is you're going to look for the transformer. So I got a transformer mounted on the bottom of that box. I'm going to get 120 volts to the transformer, 24 volts out of the transformer. Those wires are going to go back and I'm going to show you what they do. So I got two wires from the transformer. One of them is going to go through my thermostats. I have the white wires on the thermostats and I have one leg of the transformer going through there. And then I have one leg going directly to the zone valve or two zone valves, I should say. I have two yellow wires attached to one leg of the transformer and then the white wires from my thermostats attached to the other leg of the transformer. With that being said, on a call for heat, my return wire from the thermostat and this connection to these yellow wires should have 24 volts. Remember, I went in the thermostat one way and I should come back the other way, and then I have one leg of the transformer already tied in. Now, after I get 24 volts to the zone valve, the zone valve opens, it operates a switch. That's this switch right here. That's the end switch. That's what actually starts the boiler. It's important to understand that this is an isolated switch. If we disconnect these wires, we are not going to get 24 volts through them. Look, zero volts. We will, however, get continuity. So if we switch it to continuity and the valve is working, the switch closes, and I have continuity across those wires. All right, so now let's reiterate, let's put it into practice. I'm gonna change the one zone valve head. I know that it's not working because I didn't have continuity across the switch, even though I had 24 volts to the valve. I'm gonna separate all of my wires. My yellow wires are gonna be my 24 volts to the valve. My red wires are gonna be my end switch. I'm gonna start with my 24 volts from the transformer. I'm gonna take the red wire. I'm gonna go directly to one of the yellow wires on both of the zone valves. Now I'm gonna take the white wire from my transformer. I'm gonna connect it to the white wires from both of my thermostats. Once I do that, I'm gonna take the red wires, in this case I have a red and a black, the red wires from both my thermostats, and I'm gonna connect them to the yellow wires of the zone valve that they're associated with. That completes the entire circuit necessary to operate the valve. Next, I'm gonna tie in my end switches. The end switch here is a red and white wire like before. I'm taking one red from each zone valve and connecting it to the red, and I'm gonna take one red from each zone valve and I'm gonna connect it to the white. Now, if either of those zone valves open, it'll operate the boiler. If it works, it's gonna sound like this. And there you go, you did a good job. You didn't fry the transformer. You can go back and clean up the wires, do something like that. I don't know, do whatever you wanna do. But either way, hope this helps. All right, it's heating season and we're gonna be doing a maintenance on this furnace here. First thing I'm gonna do is change the filter. If you bought one of those $49 services from the billboards, then this is about all you're gonna get. Plus a sales pitch for a four inch filter and a blue light. You probably got a cracked heat exchanger. Happens all the time. I've noticed a lot of companies when they sell these maintenance agreements, they see them as nothing more than a sales opportunity. They put pressure on their technicians to upsell more work and they never really do anything of value. And then they wonder why people burn them with one star reviews. I've always seen it in the opposite light. Naturally, there's gonna be sales opportunities when you find things that are wrong. It's just gonna happen. It's nature. But I try to leave my agenda at the door and use my time working on the system to provide them with something that actually has value. Imagine that you're paying for something, you're getting value out of it. But you know who else gets something valuable out of it? Me. Because I actually feel good about what I've done and not just like a slimy dirt ball. And when it's time to get the money, I'm going to get it. Because I see the value. 
Get it? Good. See you on the next one.